Excellencies, thank you so much for joining us here at FII 7. I hope you're having a fantastic conference so far, and we're very keen on this panel to keep the thought-provoking conversations moving. My name is Jane Witherspoon. I'm the Bureau Chief Middle East for Euronews, and it's my pleasure to be your MC for this panel, How to Build Cradles of Innovation. So, in a world teeming with nascent technologies and ideas, emerging markets are blossoming into vibrant entrepreneurship and innovation hubs. We'll be looking at how investors and stakeholders can foster an ecosystem that not only thrives on innovation, but also ensures a sustainable and equitable impact. <laughs> So joining me, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panel. I'll introduce down the line, and then they'll give a few, um, a few words about what they do, who they are, just to put everything into context. So to my left, we have Oliver Holley, co-founder, CEO, and managing partner for Speed Invest. Shun Niata, founder and managing partner at Bicycle Capital. Tamara Kadumi, co-founder and general partner at Venture Souk. And Anil Randave. Rana, uh, Ranave. No, oh no, we got it wrong. We were trying to pr practice this. That's because I practiced. Ranadive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whee! We got there in the end. <laughs> uh, founder and managing partner at Soma Capital. So, Oliver, over to you to explain a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. So, my name is Oliver. I started Speed Invest uh, 12 years ago uh, out of Vienna, which back then was anything but a capital for venture capital. Uh, we started as a tiny fund focusing on early stage pre-seed and seed uh, startups in Europe. By now, 12 years later, we, are, uh, we have invested in roughly 350 companies across Europe, offices from London to Berlin to Paris, Munich and Vienna, and we manage roughly 1.2 billion uh, euros under management. Uh, still focusing on the early stage and still trying to build a pan-European platform to support yeah, basically all founders in Europe that want to build something global. Thank you. Over to Shu. Vienna, the emerging market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Back then for sure, yeah. <laughs> My name is Shu Nyata. I was an investor at SoftBank for many years around the world. And my partner and I, Marcelo Claure, and I uh, launched a Latin America-focused fund. It's a growth fund, $700 million fund, focused on Latin America, which for us mainly means Brazil and Mexico. I'm Tamar Kadumi. I'm a general partner at VentureSuk. We're a thematic venture investor based here in MENA. We have people across Saudi, the UAE, and Egypt. Right now, we're investing into fintech. Uh, we have a $100 million fintech fund backing fintech companies in MENA at their seed and their Series A stage. And climate tech, we have a global climate tech fund, which is $50 million. So that's what we're focused on right now. Thank you, Tamar. Anil. Uh, Anil Ranadive, founder of Soma Capital. and I'm from uh, Silicon Valley, I uh, grew up in San Francisco Bay Area. I, I was there uh, my whole life. A, a critical part of the kind of Soma story and journey is uh, I, I had an immigrant I Indian father who was kind of a superhuman company builder, uh, had, had the ultimate American dream story, came to America, went to America uh, starting from nothing, built a multi-billion dollar uh, software company that digitized Wall Street in the 90s, uh, Tipco, was middleware competing against Oracle, um, doing billions in revenue, profitable public company, and got into sports, bought the Sacramento Kings NBA team, was involved in the early stages, seeding, mentoring Google, Yahoo, Salesforce, eBay, e even Steve Jobs, uh, when Steve was building Next operating system. So I had really small shoes uh, to fill. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I had, luckily, the greatest gift was I had a lot of psychological warfare from my father growing up saying, hey, you deserve nothing, you get nothing, you know, you're, you're a loser, you know, get, get, get the heck out of the house. And, and so, yeah, my, the Soma journey is um, kind of starving to prove to myself and to the world that we can make a, make a big dent in the universe. So spent 11 years failing at startups, truly embraced the founder journey, took out a bunch of credit card debt, declared bankruptcy at one point, and uh, turns out I'm a slightly better uh, uh, VC. So with Soma Capital in uh, uh, just, just about nine, in Silicon Valley, we've invested early in hundreds of startups uh, with a diversified strategy, uh, in, including 21 unicorns now. Uh, and, and a, a bunch of those are in, um, are in emerging markets. We've been active in MENA. We've been active in, in, uh, in uh, LATAM, India, Southeast Asia. And uh, yeah, super excited to be here and, and be, the, be the best resource partner to everyone possible. 
Thank you so much, gentlemen. Let's get straight down to business with some questions. So I'm going to ask the first one to Shu. If you can let me know, you know, what are the most essential elements of a robust innovation ecosystem that allows entrepreneurship to thrive in emerging markets? Yeah, it, it's actually a really difficult thing to do. I'm on the board of an organization called Endeavor that is probably the leading mentorship organization for entrepreneurs around the world, especially in emerging markets. So they have studied this question in particular for quite a while. And what you need is success, which is a bit of chicken and egg, right? Mm. You need big outcomes, which Endeavor calls big bubbles, which create success in terms of talent and liquidity that feeds back into the system. That's when you know you have an ecosystem. Up to that point, you're investing in trying to create one. So it takes quite a while, but ultimately the marker that really matters is this idea of big bubbles, big companies that create liquidity and talent that go right back into the system. I know Oliver will have something to say from a European perspective to add on to that. Yeah, I think we often underestimate how long it takes and how multifaceted it is. It's easy to focus on the, on the, on the hard facts. It's easy to focus on capital and sizes of funds and, and, and exit returns. But actually, if I look at the journey that we went through in Europe, what really mattered was the change of culture and the change of ambition and the change of psycholo psychological mindset of the founders. And that takes generations. I think that's why Europe is still probably 20, 30 years behind the US. And then within Europe, some ecosystems are 10 years ahead of others. So that's where we are. Well, Tamir, you're MENA region. You know, what are your inputs onto that from what you see? I think that uh, what's critical in the MENA region is that that bubble actually covers multiple countries. I think our big limitation here is that in MENA we have, in MENA we have everything that you would need. You, we have human resources, we have natural resources, we have tons of capital, we have some of the highest GDP per capita in the world, we have some of the densest cities in the world, we have geopolitical significance, we have ge you know, geographic proximity to the rest of the world, we have everything but it's divided into 20 markets that in and of themselves are, are meaningless. And with all due respect, you know, any individual country, including Saudi Arabia, is not big enough to drive outcomes that we're looking for. So the bubble, the challenge that we have here is actually creating that bubble, but in a way that it encompasses multiple countries that, uh, that don't operate. It's not a monolith. You know, we, have different, we have different countries that have different rules and different habits. And so I think that uh, here, ecosystem building, we need, to, we need to continually hammer home that it's got to be a pan-regional effort. And, well, and you've had some big outcomes, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like Kareem. Yeah. We absolutely have. Uh, Kareem, uh, you know, you guys know Kareem. Souk was a big outcome. Kitopi, I think, is a very successful business. Tabby is one of our companies that I think is very successful. What is similar about all of these is that they contort, they morph themselves to become at the same time a Saudi company or a UAE company or an Egyptian company. So they are able to create a, a platform that that becomes pan-regional, and that gets them the outcome that they, Uber doesn't buy Kareem if it doesn't sit across many countries. Iraq, uh, maybe you guys didn't realize, was one of the most valuable countries in that acquisition in terms of growth rate and, and market size. So, you know, that is where we're gonna get the outcomes for buyers, they're, they're interested in buying countries, the companies that are cutting across multiple countries. I'll, I'll, I'll give a contrarian idea, actually, an anti-Silicon uh, Valley idea that so venture in the Bay Area started in late 1960s, early 1970s from people like Don Valentine, Eugene Kleiner, Arthur Roth, Bill Elfers, Building Sequoia Kleiner, Inia Gray, Ben Rock. And it started out as a lean, time diversified um, fund strategy where they would work with a few founders, they'd be really hands on, it was a milestone based business. And the last few years, there's been this AUM arms race of Silicon Valley VCs dumping tens of billions into these companies. And if you look at some of the all-time greatest um, software and technology companies built by people like uh, Bill Hewlett, David Packard, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, Larry Ellison, Mark Benioff, those companies all raised zero venture capital. And e even Google, Apple didn't raise a lot. Google was like 20 some, 23 million. Uh, Facebook didn't raise a lot. Midjourney, one of the top grossing generative AI companies of today raised zero. And so you could say that actually a uh, constraint in the early days and having mafias of brilliant people around each other, accelerating each other, inspiring and motivating each other is the most critical magic. And, and kind of an anti-Silicon Valley is that it's just been oversaturated. Venture's oversaturated there. There's been too many dollars dumped into these companies that makes them loose with decisions, 
um, you know, over hiring, and, and so, that, so that actually some, some of the magic we've seen in, in some uh, emerging market investments we've made with multiple unicorns now is the camarad camaraderie, uh, highly concentrated areas of mafias of entrepreneurs breaking off uh, from other uh, great companies like Rappi uh, that we invested in, in, uh, in, in South America or like Flutterwave in Africa or Razorpay in India. And, and that actually um, you don't need tons of, you know, tens of billions of Silicon Valley VC dollars dumped into these companies uh, to, to have great, incredible breakouts. How, how yep. do you evaluate which ventures have viable scaling global potential versus those that are best serving a local or regional market? Yes, yeah, so we look at teams from contrarian backgrounds. So one of our great stories, there was a team uh, out of MIT, they were friends, they were building products together, and uh, their names were Alex and Shuo, and one uh, was from China, another was from uh, Israel and, and uh, Paris and San Francisco. They wanted to uh, build a product for startups like them to onboard uh, remote teammates all over the world. And it seemed like a really small market in the early days, but some of the generational companies uh, seem silly day one. The market's too saturated. Do we need another search engine? The market doesn't exist. Uh, or it seems like a small feature, which ends up being a wedge for something much bigger. And this team now, the, the company's called Deal. Their last round was uh, 12 billion. And it, you know, they started out with two people and an idea. And they've been able to scale globally and, and uh, you know, allow uh, teams in emerging markets to onboard uh, remotely and, and you know, push humanity forward. And, and I think a theme that tends to come up is this idea that we need to build global companies. Mm -hmm. Starting with that mindset often is the wrong thing to do. Because the foundational nature of venture capital and entrepreneurship is you solve a specific problem. Yeah. And in fact, the more specific it is, the better. And sometimes that can seem small. But if you don't do that right, you don't get the chance to play the game again. And so it's critical not to think, I'm going to build a global beating company when you're in the seed or series A stage. You have to solve that particular problem really well. And then you'd be surprised at how expandable and generalizable it might be across geographies. Tamara, I think you've got some thoughts on this as well, again, coming from the perspective of the region that you work in. Yeah, I, I actually don't totally agree with that. And here's my argument. A lot of the innovation that happens in this region is coming from the company's ability to cross those borders. I actually think that's where the creativity comes in. I think we're going to see less, if you're talking about ecosystem formation, mm. I think it's unlikely that we're going to see pure play tech, hardcore tech development that is coming out of this region for some time. I think we'll get there. In the interim, what we're going to see is super creative and, 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 and super innovative ways of building supply chains that, cr that cut across country. I, I actually, I get your point that yes, you want to you fix, you want to solve one problem really, really well first, and then think about geographic expansion, that's one. But if the challenge itself are the geographic borders, which I think is the case in this region, I don't think any of our businesses become viable if they don't cut across the entire region. It's just not big enough. As a region, we're 400 million people. But as, a, as, as individual countries, none of the countries are big enough. So I actually think that is the, that is the problem that they are solving in this region. And may, maybe some quick exciting stats. So there's, there's already multiple unicorns in Saudi. I, I think there's uh, six or seven. And 40% uh, of all MENA investments was, was in Saudi. So majority has already shifted to here. And there's been about half a billion in, in uh, VC dollars uh, in, invested in Saudi companies. And so it just takes that uh, small match in the beginning with brilliant, incredible unicorn breakout companies, which exists. Uh, to kind of kickstart uh, something special, and, and Saudi's leading the way already in MENA. Yeah, I, th I think the point, leadership in Saudi, spot on. It's like, have the companies start here. Have the companies get to critical size, get to critical mass. The challenge is going to be, let the Saudi companies go and move beyond the Saudi market. And, you know, and, and the, 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 the critical point there is intent. Saudis need to believe that it is their, in their, it is in their mission to to go and grow in Kuwait. It's in their mission to go and grow in, in, in Egypt and in, in Morocco and the UAE and not get content that, hey, we've built a great business that's in Saudi. Although to, to that point, it's a challenge all the big markets in emerging markets face. So Nigeria has the same dynamic. Brazil has the same dynamic. Because founders there think, my market is big enough and this is the most important market in the region. So often the encouragement to those founders is, yes, but because you've built such a incredible company in such a difficult place, you should be able to expand right. beyond here. But it's, yeah. it's not just a, 
a problem here. But yeah, I, I, no. I would well, argue. I think Oliver has something he. Ha yeah, I wanted to argue that I think the interesting element here is that this type of fragmented ecosystems is very similar again to Europe and to, to the region here. You cannot just rely on one market. We have one company that we invested in. Uh, it's called Move. Uh, they started out, out of Nigeria. Uh, actually, a team educated in France started out of Nigeria, then moved to South Africa, moved to India, now headquartered in Dubai, and are now actually uh, conquering the UK. And I think that's the ambition that we all seek for. We need these, these players that are able to, to expand extremely fast and not be limited by, bo bo by national boundaries. And you need investors that are able to support this. And I think that's where you can do play a lot. Uh, your card's really wrong if you, if you if also as investors you, you try to play a local or regional game. Talking of investors, how can they balance providing startup funding with ensuring investments have equitable impact in communities? Oliver, I'm going to start with you again on this one. Well, I mean, first of all, our job is to make founders successful. I mean, that's the biggest impact that we will have across the board, and that's what makes us happy and satisfied in our job. Fundamentally, if you look at, at our European uh, landscape and you look at this ESG topic, uh, I would argue, if, if I look at my fund, my recent fund, we invested in roughly 40 companies in the last 12 months. More than half of them you would, you would qualify as ESG relevant. Mm. Health, uh, fi access to finance, climate. Uh, these are huge topics and they're huge business opportunities. So you don't have to think about this as a compromise or a trade-off. These are huge business opportunities. They may or not yet here in this region, front and center. Here, front and center, it's fintech, it's marketplaces, but they will come. And the knowledge that comes, that is built in Europe, will come to this region. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. What time scale are you looking at then for this to be adopted here? Look at, in Europe, it's now. In Europe, we are like, the, the, the momentum, the money is going into these topics. So I would think it's a few years, not, not, not much longer. The, the nice thing in emerging markets, and we were discussing this earlier, is startups are almost definitionally serving the underserved. Yep. That is the big market opportunity. And so to talk about community impact and ESG as a separate thing kind of doesn't make sense. It's, it's inherent to what the business is doing. And often in Latin America, that's for sure the case. The governments love it on both sides of the aisle because what you're doing is bringing products and services to people who are underserved. It's not disruption, it's inclusion. That's very much what the startups are about. Yeah, I think that here, if you put it in context of where we are in the region right now, we're in the midst of a transition to a knowledge-based economy. That's what Vision 2030 is. And that's what the roadmap for all of the countries of the GCC is. It's a transition away. And in my m recollection, it happened in 2014. It really kicked into overdrive. Mm. That, like, that was what came shortly after that was the uh, Vision Fund, you know, MASA. You know, but that was, this is part of a, 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 a plan, a long-standing plan that's gone through multiple permutations to transition from what we were, you know, an industrial carbon-based economy into a knowledge-based economy. And that actually is the ESG, if you will, that is, that, that is relevant here. You know, we, and so these companies that, that, are, that, are, that are starting, that we're backing, they're all feeding into that. They're all feeding into the strategic agenda or, or, or prerogative of, of the countries that we're in. What, how do you track it? Like that, that's inherent in the business. We don't need to contrive some new thing that does that. Does that. It's going to happen. What we can do is just track it. Just track it. Just have the companies, hey, how many, how many female employees do you have? You know, report that on a quarterly basis. And, and what is your, you know, sort of carbon output? Just record that and, and share it on a regular basis. I think that just recording is probably most of what we're looking for. When we bring things, I guess, let's bring it to regulation and policymakers playing a fostering, um, the, the role they play in fostering innovation, you know, how can they encourage development whilst allowing organic growth? And I think, Oliver, maybe you can talk about this from a European perspective and tell us, you know, what has worked there, what hasn't worked so well. So, maybe that's not so well known, but uh, a vast majority of the European venture ecosystem is actually funded by public money, right? It's, it's EIF, it's KFW, it's BPI in France. These are huge investors in, in funds. Uh, and they really spurred uh, the, the ecosystem in Europe in the last 20 years. What were the mistakes? I mean, first of all, national boundaries. You see a lot of these 
specific regulations where you force investors to just invest in one, one country. And again, coming back to the regional topic, that's too small of a thing that doesn't work. Second one is the political timeframes of creating success doesn't align with what venture is about. Venture is long term. Building an ecosystem takes years, tens of years. And uh, looking for quick marketing wins is not uh, helping here. So that's a big, big uh, mistake. And I hope that this region is not playing it. We all need to be long term committed to the region that we invest in. And that's, that's key. Tamar, what do you think that we can learn in this region from the stuff that Oliver's just been saying? Yeah, I think there's a lot to borrow from, from Europe. I think there's a lot to borrow from Latin America. I think Southeast Asia, I know that you, you've made a lot of investments there. We, we, we think that this is not something that is a blueprint that doesn't exist. We think, we think it's there. We think there's, there's definitely methods that other companies have employed and ecosystems that have been built, built across uh, other ecosystems that we can borrow from, for sure. Endeavor is, uh, is kind of, what, one, of the, one of the primary architects of these blueprints, so we, we take whatever we can from them. Anil? Yeah, I think what uh, one example, what Southeast Asia uh, leadership did partnering in the uh, semiconductor industry, you could think about leadership here partnering for uh, clean energy and, and what's happening in, in uh, re renewable energy. And that, um, you know, there, there, there's, there's very strong proof uh, with the kind of explosion in uh, semiconductor in industry in Southeast Asia. Um, that leadership, government, working with uh, entrepreneurs can, can, can have massive, uh, you know, great results and, and, and you know, push whole economies uh, forward. And, and then also cross-pollinating, uh, ma uh, making it uh, attractive as, as, as what's happening uh, for companies to set up uh, headquarters and, and scale uh, to uh, create more cross-pollination of ideas, of talent uh, for, the, for local uh, incredible founders that, that, that are getting, um, getting their companies started. Um, and, and focus, uh, as Shu said, on, on solving real problems. You look at uh, m the six or seven unicorns, they're, they're B2B, uh, B2C marketplaces, uh, uh, software and solutions for small businesses, uh, FinTech, uh, software in, in uh, supply chain and logistics. Uh, so solving real problems, um, g government uh, partnering with entrepreneurs ha has a chance to, to make a massive impact, as will happen in, in semiconductor uh, in industry in Southeast Asia, and, and then, um, you know, making it really attractive uh, for tech companies to come have an office here and, and scale to the region. There's hundreds of millions of people and, you know, a, a, a shot to, um, you know, kind of do what uh, Singapore um, did in, in uh, Southeast Asia is, is, is happening and, and incredibly exciting. I, think, I, I, I think do want to give, give an example that's probably not that well known of regulation, but it's actually not regulation. It's the government participating in the tech ecosystems by building technology themselves. Mm -hmm. So in Mexico, the government has this real-time database of invoices called SAT that is an instant tracking of every single invoice along a whole number of dimensions. So any business that invoices any other business, that's automatically available in real-time in a public database. Brazil has built a real-time consumer-to-consumer and business-to-consumer payment network yeah. uh, called PIX that's become the most used system of payment, and it's free and instant bank-to-bank -bank account most used system of payment in Brazil over the last few years. And that's the government building tech mm. that unlocks all of these opportunities by, by creating an even playing field and a lot of rich data for people to use to build upon. And I haven't seen that done as much in Southeast Asia. I don't know. If yeah, that, that's an amazing example. I, I mean, uh, TSMC, Samsung, you know, th these companies were created with, with government collaboration. There's some, some of the most valuable, important uh, companies for technology on the planet you know, was, was with government uh, collaboration. Yeah. yeah, I think if you open up your Buttaka app and look at the news today, there was a story that was announced that this company, Nupco, which is like a procurement platform that's owned by the PIF, uh, that all, all the big enterprises and government entities use, is going to list on Tadawal. And that's a perfect example. That was just like, that's like the, the, one of the announcements today. But I think that we actually have a superpower here, which is like, all right, let's say you have a problem. I, without, without like sort of taking a position, let's say climate, climate tech is an important thing to you. If you're in, let's say, Europe or in North America, there's like the propensity for actually the, the, the populace to like disagree on the fundamental need of that problem. There's like, you know, oh, there's like literally dim elements of like, oh no, that's not a problem. And, and, and it becomes a fight almost at a political level. Mm -hmm. And here there's 
eminent domain of everything. If the government decides that it wants to change the world in some particular arena, it has the capital and it has the expediency to be able to do it. It has the wherewithal to, to make an act big change. Now, you have to be very responsible with that, with that superpower, but we have that superpower. So I think what you're saying could be affected in a, in a really strong way in this part of the world. Yeah, and roll back even further. Internet was created, uh, DARPA, with government collaboration as well. So un unlimited possibility. Yeah. Maybe one, one last aspect I would like to stress is talent. Yes. Because I think, the, from my experience at least, I mean, everybody focuses on entrepreneurial talent, of course. We need to bring talent to the region. But an underserved aspect is investment talent. I can, I can say in Europe, many, many of these smaller ecosystems, they have zero experienced, sophisticated investment talent there that actually is able to build bridges to global investors to, to shape these companies into building something big and helping entrepreneurs. And I think that's where also uh, our collaboration here is so important because we need more people on the ground here that bring maybe 10, 20 years of venture investing to, to the region. That, is, uh, that helped us at least extremely to, to learn from the best in the US and elsewhere. Well, you've actually done my job for me because I was going to bring the conversation on there to emerging innovation hubs in the regions where they have talent gaps. You know, you mentioned there a little bit about it, but the ecosystems, how can they proactively build human capital via connections to maybe education institutions or workforce development programs? Where can that tie in? I think that, again, we can learn from the best. Uh, if you look at Cambridge or the UK Research Triangle, I mean, they've been able to, and again, it took decades, decades, it took 20, 30 years to build this. But what they did is they created not only excellent science hubs, but they created an excellence around them in terms of uh, accelerators, early stage investors, later stage investors, board members. And at the end of the day, these people are around. And with the right incentives and with the right momentum and belief, I think you can also replicate this here relatively quickly. Not, not every location has incredible educational institutions, yeah. especially for technical training, but what you can do is create a place people want to be. And I think COVID changed this for all of us. So one, one thing we've observed a lot in uh, Mexico City and Sao Paulo in particular, those two cities, is they've become a very interesting place for expats to go live, especially Americans, and it's the same time zone, basically, plus or minus. So it's very easy for a really good tech company in Sao Paulo, Mexico City, to make a pitch to a US executive and say, why don't you come have your next chapter here? You can work remotely half the time, or you can move down. We're going to make it easy for you. That's something in the hands of these ecosystems. Mm. And people want adventures. They're going to go to interesting places and build interesting things if you make it easy for them to be there. Tama, um, you know, what models have you seen successfully uh, translate acadom academic knowledge into viable new ventures? Yeah, if I can, if I can make a comment on the last, yeah, yeah, uh, build off the last yeah, point. Yeah. So here we've seen academic institutions that have started, at, at not at a big scale. So you have, you have KAUST, which is amazing. You have MBSC yeah. uh, uh, and CAKE. Uh, and, then, and then in Abu Dhabi, you have New York University has done a great job of building inst educational institutions that are spitting out talent. And, uh, and so I think we're on the right track. I think that, that it's got to start with, the, with, with education. And I think that, that the, the government has done heretofore a very good job of, of seeding that, but it needs to get a lot bigger. And then I go back to that point that I made. We have it in the Arab world what would like here's a crazy idea you just build a canal to damascus and let every well qualified ruby and react developer come and be and work for a saudi startup and the same pools exist in egypt and they exist in morocco and they exist in refugee camps so we have lots of talent if we were to allow it to seamlessly move across, uh, across our region. So it's educational institutions, and then it's leveraging the resource base that we, we do have here in our market. Let's bring in something else then when talking about the region. What happens, you know, living in a divided region? You know, what is happening now is particularly super pertinent. You know, what are the major obstacles 
uh, in terms of geopolitical stability. What, what do I? Yeah. No, this was to you. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. get the easy question. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. to throw that Ge in. <laughs> geopolitical <laughs> instability? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, that no, plays I mean, into, you know. How that plays into us? Yeah, and what we're, what we're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's inherent in our, you know, if, if, if like, I've gone all in on venture in MENA. MENA is like notoriously one of the most volatile regions in the world. And venture is like arguably the most volatile asset class. <laughs> if, any, like, if anybody's a wealth manager, actually my partner, mine, uh, used to be a like, wealth manager with Citibank. And he, it's like, you look at my pie slices and he'd be like, you are an absolute idiot. Like, why are you, wh why are you putting all of this into, the, in, this, into literally the most risky combination of, of things that you could do? Yeah. But it's a, like, we have conviction. We, we are believers in, 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 in what's happening. Yes, there's tons of volatility. But you take what happens and you have to turn it into opportunity yeah. and, and, and act on that. And I think we're full of opportunity in this, in this part of the world. I think it's very simple. If you, if you come back to what we said before, that the only way for this region, as for Europe, as for any other smaller ecosystems, is to collaborate and, and reduce boundaries, then obviously uh, political division uh, is exactly the counter argument and exactly what will be the, the, the biggest hurdle to overcome. So that's, that's I'll, very I'll, clear. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a different point about volatility of the category. I think uncertainty is what entrepreneurs are built for. They are the ultimate problem solvers. And this formula of give the ultimate problem solvers capital and scale it up as they solve the problem is a proven formula. And so my solution to an uncertain world is you've got to empower the entrepreneurs with capital, and, and they will solve the uncertainty before our eyes. So give that capital to young entrepreneurs, and magic will happen. Like, actually, Shu, it's like, r right on. It's like, <laughs> that is what, that, that, because there is uncertainty, because there is volatility, that makes our job, like, like, gives our job meaning. It is us, it's, it's like, it's these tech businesses that are going to fix the issues that we have in this region. It's not like, oh, aren't you deterred because of in uncertainty? No, 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 no. It's because there's uncertainty that the we're drive. doing what we, yes. And yes. If, uh, if you read the, uh, the Elon Isaacson book, uh, he talks a lot about pain threshold uh, being very high and being basically a, a magnet um, for uncertainty and pain. And, and that, as crazy as that sounds, <laughs> the, the generational builders that are putting humanity on their shoulders um, they come out of constraint and uncertainty in the beginning, and they're just a magnet for solving the biggest, hardest, most complex things possible. And so it actually, I agree with all of you, it's the perfect recipe uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, un unimaginable entrepreneurship. We've got a few minutes left on the clock. I'm going to bring it back to Oliver. What do you see as being the biggest challenge in the next three to five years? Period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, just fix the, yeah, fix the world. No, no. <laughs> fix the world. In terms of cradles of innovation. Uh, unleashing that, exactly that entrepreneurial energy uh, from the very, very early stages of pre-seed all the way to IPO and, and replicating that model, uh, yeah, basically in the emerging markets. That's why also we are here because we see this as a, a, a huge opportunity but also the biggest challenge. There's so much work to be done. And we don't have the time of Silicon Valley to do it in 50 years. We need to do it in less than 10 years. So that's the challenge. Yeah. Sure. I think it's having faith. So Boston and Silicon Valley started at the same level. And Silicon Valley said, here's capital, go build. And Boston said, well, let's make sure the downside is protected. Let's make sure there's an exit for this business. Let's make sure this and that and the other. And Boston is not even in the discussion anymore when it comes to innovation. You have to have faith that these problem-solving beings that we call entrepreneurs will figure it out and just let them go. That's the hardest thing to do for emerging ecosystems because they can't wrap their heads around that. Tama. Yeah, I, I think that we're, I think we're at a super interesting inflection point between the private sector and the public sector. Like, I think we're in a bigger, we're in a bigger sort of like, it, we're at a bigger inflection point here, which is like how, how you seed economic activity to the private sector, which should unleash entrepreneurial spirit that should, that should crash through 
any sort of glass ceiling that existed because there's sort of incumbent power and economic structures that exist in this region. And so, and, and, I, and, and again, it's going to be our ecosystem, it's going to be our industry that, that, that sort of ushers that transition through. But I think that, like, the way that the public and the private sector uh, come together, interact with each other, is that this is a fundamental shift, and I think that's kind of like, it, that's going to represent the biggest challenge for us to sort of navigate that in a, in a way that is uh, seamless. Final thoughts from Silicon Valley, Anil? Yeah, so I'll give another like magnet analogy. Entrepreneurs are magnets for uh, constraint, for pain, for solving huge problems. Al also for, uh, they're magnets for other smart people. They want to go to where um, really talented, smart people uh, are. And, um, you know, at San Francisco, I've, I've worried about some of the uh, crime and in, in, in certain issues that, you know, that's, that certain smart people won't want to be in, in, you know, some of these areas. And, and, and so I'd say what, what I'd be most focused on is just building, building community, making it uh, as, as attractive as possible uh, for smart people to all want to start, um, you know, aggregating and, and compiling. And, and um, yeah, so, so I'd say just community building and uh, ha having as many smart people together as possible. Oliver Holle, Shu Nayata, Tama Kadumi, and Anil Ranadive. Wouldn't make the same mistake <laughs> twice. Thank you so much. What a pleasurable panel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being our audience here today.